I too now solemnly pledge myself throughout the remaining time God grants me to uphold the constitutional principles at the heart of our nation. I think he'll be a very good king. I think he'll be a compassionate king. He cares about the country. Well, I always thought that Charles would make a wonderful king because he cares so much. He cares about his country. He cares about its heritage. He cares about the planet. And he cares about the people. What you can see in Charles is genuine desire to make things better for people. I mean, he genuinely is somebody who has said, I worry about the fate of my subjects. Charles has always wanted to be king. I think it's fair to say that for decades, he has been waiting to become king because he's seen this as his consummation of what he's been doing all his life. The king served the longest apprenticeship, I think, in history as Prince of Wales. I don't think, I know he'll be a good king. He'll be a caring king, a compassionate king. He'll be a king for the people. I shall endeavor to serve you with loyalty, respect, and love, as I have throughout my life. He was seen as somebody who was quite austere and quite cold. And I think that now, thankfully, there has been a narrowing between the public perception of the public king and indeed the private man. With Camilla at his side, I think he is going to be uh, wonderful and compassionate and understanding and all the things that he needs to be. Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to. And to feel this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders. And I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. The king's public persona and private persona are very similar. Obviously, there has to be a... It, it's slightly different, because I've always said that it doesn't matter what you do in life, you, you act it, you always have to act and do it. But, but more or less, what you see is, is very much how he is behind closed doors. He's, he's very similar. I've noticed recently the prince or the king that we see in public is very similar to the, the prince or king that I knew. So that's what's so interesting, is seeing the, how they're becoming more... Uh, confident in, in showing how they are in in private, which is in fantastic. And we get so much inside footage now that we never used to get. So we see private audiences and meetings and all sorts of things that we would never have, have seen, what, 20, 30 years ago. So, it's, we, so that's why it makes it easier to say to people, well, the man, the, the, the king that I knew or know is the same as the the king that you, you see, because that is what you see is, is how he is. Well, he was a very studious child. I mean, he was somebody who was quite unlike Prince Philip, who was a much more boisterous character. He was unlike his mother as well. Who, from, his mother was somebody who was very serious from a very young age, and Charles, I think, inherited this seriousness. But what he had, which she didn't have, was a real interest in learning and a real interest in books and things like that. This is seen as quite anomalous because members of the royal family are not traditionally seen as intellectuals, but Charles, I think, was seen as somebody who had intellectual ideas and interests possibly inculcated in him from his nannies at a very young age. Well, Queen Elizabeth was a very dutiful mother. And if you think that she, she, she became queen aged 25, she had, you know, Prince Charles was, I think he was four, nearly, and, and Princess Anne was only, well, she was born in 1950. So she was only th just three when, she, when the queen was crowned. So basically her children were taken away from her. She just didn't have time to be with them. Uh, so she would see them in the morning you know, for 15 minutes, and she would see them at night for half an hour. But again, you have to judge it by the moors of the time. That was how aristocratic families worked. 
Well, when the coronation took place in 1953, it was quite interesting because Charles was obviously just about old enough to be at the coronation and to have an understanding of what was going on in a way that none of his siblings who are currently born did. And I suspect that for a very young boy, it would have been an overwhelming experience. I mean, the pageantry, the noise, the sheer number of people. But it would also have been, probably by then, in the back of his mind, this thought percolating about, it's going to be me one day, this is all going to happen for me. It was a three-hour ceremony. It was, everybody recalls, the coldest June day that had ever happened. And it was pouring with rain. And people, you know, there, there was, if you go back, this is 1953. So the, the army was enormous. And they had street, every sort of foot or two foot feet along the pavement, they were what they call street liners, which were soldiers. And they were all really cold and they were given sugar lumps infused with brandy to sort of keep them keep them going and the ceremony itself was very very serious and very religious and very dramatic and it's impossible to speculate exactly how he would have felt because we have no record of his thoughts of a time and i doubt very much he remembers exactly how it was but certainly it must have been a sense of absolutely terrifying pressure being put on you as a young child to see all this at such a young age and to think one day, unless something horrible happens or unexpected, this will all be for me as well. Well, obviously he was the eldest sibling of four, and I think it's fair to say that because he was the first sibling, and because he was going to be Prince of Wales and then eventually he was going to become king, there was always a sense that he was the one who was given the most attention and the most focus. So I think there is something that he, on the one hand, he thrived on, because who wouldn't thrive in a situation where you're always told that you're the most important one? Now there's one new boy still to arrive, and here he comes with his mother and father. The headmaster receives the royal party. What, no tuck box? Well, there's plenty of room in that trunk, no doubt. Prince Philip was a pupil here. His son looks happy to be following in father's footsteps. Well, Charles was sent to public school in Scotland at Gordonston, which is an infamously tough school where essentially the attitude is spare the rod and spoil the child. But Prince Philip, who had also been to Gordonston, saw this as an opportunity to make his son a man. But it made Charles embittered, it made him, I think, somebody quite closed in terms of his emotions because he had to keep so much to himself. And he actually thought that Gordonston would be good for Charles because it was up in the north of Scotland, away from the press, and it was, you know, it was meant to be wonderful outdoor life and, and, and you know, great emphasis was placed upon the training of the mind as well as the training of the brain. And Philip thought it would be perfect. I think the Queen and the Queen Mother probably thought that it, he would be, being such a sensitive young man, he probably would have been better to go to Eton. Prince Philip wanted his son to be uh, an image of himself. He wanted him to be macho and he wanted him to be sporty and he wanted him to have a sort of very strong personality. Well, Charles wasn't like that at all. He was very timid. He wasn't particularly sporty. He, 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 you know, he was a little awkward and he wasn't really the son that Philip hoped he'd have. So as Charles grew, their relationship was, just didn't work. The great court of Trinity College, Cambridge, and the royal procession arrived. The minis serve to underline Prince Charles' hope that his time at Cambridge will be uncluttered by deference to his royal status. The first Prince of Wales to attend the university for a hundred years, he'll be living in a room in New Court, and it was here he met a friend of his, third-year student Robert Woods, son of the Dean of Windsor. It was quite common but before Charles for monarchs to go up to Oxford or Cambridge. I mean, Edward, Edward VIII, when he was Prince of Wales, went to Magdalen College, Oxford. But most people went to universities simply to acquire Sort of a tick box, whereas Charles actually went to Cambridge with the intention of studying. He was the first member of the royal family to have actually gone to university with the intention of doing a three-year course and having a degree. But he had a very good time at Cambridge because I think after the privations of prep school and boarding school, he found people he was comfortable with, he found an academic environment that he enjoyed, and he managed to act a lot as well. So I think you can say that Cambridge was in many respects the making of, of, of Prince Charles, and then of course when he became King Charles, he still been met somebody who's had very strong links to his old university. And he got a two-two two in history in the end, which actually for somebody who came from a non-academic background was quite an achievement. 
Uh, I'm letting out a little slack, uh, a little slack now. Uh, yes, uh, uh, taking up the strain, taking up the strain. This is most exciting, most exciting, ladies and gentlemen. I've never seen anything quite like it before. I think I've got quite a large one here. It, it's really very large indeed. I, I, I... Well, Charles has his investiture as Prince of Wales at Carnarvon Castle on July 1st, 1969, and it was a hugely symbolic occasion because he was being given the title of Prince of Wales publicly. It was very much a sense that after a decade in which the royal family had a quite difficult time reputationally, it was an attempt to take back control, if you like. It was an attempt to take back the idea that pageantry and pomp and this kind of big formal ceremony could show, first of all, what the future of monarchy was going to be, and secondly, exactly what he could expect when he was going to be Prince of Wales. At the main college building on the seafront, Prince Charles has done most of his work. In the language laboratory, he's spent an hour each day perfecting his Welsh grammar and pronunciation. His tutor is Mr. Edward Millwood, a former vice president of the Welsh Nationalist Party. Well, this has been a crash course. It's been only part of a crash course amongst other studies. And in the short time that he's been working, he's developed a very good accent and uh, I'm sure it's going to stand him in very good stead from now on. Carnarvon waits like a bride for her wedding, gaily dressed for the big moment, but anxious too that something could go wrong, though every precaution has been taken to make sure that it doesn't. As traffic jams block the town, army bomb disposal experts are on the alert. His investiture was obviously quite a big, a big thing. Uh, it was obviously broadcast, televised, which was a would be a fast. From that, I want to say from that day forward, but probably even before then, the the kind of the training and the preparation of one day becoming king began. And I think, you know, he took this very seriously his whole life. Mayach and Echiad, Wedivan Hofor and Lewis, Agachlav and Sikarhai, for Maud. Wedi cymryd sylwi, o'r gobeithion am lygywyd and the nhw. Charles' attitude towards every kind of formal event at this stage in his life, I think, could be best summarised as fear. If you look at him and you look at his face and the pictures and the film that exists, he looks frightened, he looks like he's not confident about the situation, and he looks as if he's finding it quite difficult to cope with all the attention placed upon him. Because there's always the sense, I think, that having to live up to not just your mother's example, but examples of every single monarch who's gone before you. What's really nice is I noticed when I was working for him at Highgrove, he was very much training his son, Prince William, in, I believe, in how he would become a Prince of Wales, and he was teaching him all the things that he had learned. So he's passed it on to Prince William, who is now the Prince of Wales. Well, any heir to the throne always has a series of responsibilities, some of which are quite dull, I mean, going to functions, opening things, meeting people. Some are more exciting, going on international tours and things like that. And Charles got on with it, because essentially every member of the royal family knew and knows that to get on with something like this is what you're there for. You're not there to be lionised all the time. You are a public servant, and public service is something that is drilled into them very, very young. It's been traditional that any member, any male member of a royal family would be expected to spend time in the army. And Charles was not an obvious fit to spend time in the armed forces. But the fact that he served in the RAF for several years in the 1970s was an indication that, first of all, he could put his mind to something like this and do it with... I don't think it's... I think it's true to say that compared to, say, Prince Andrew, who was quite a distinguished pilot, Charles was not exactly out of a top drawer in the RAF, but it was still an invaluable time for him because he found himself mixing with his men on much more equal terms than he ever had been able to when he was at school. Prince Charles stepped out from the Fleet Air Arms headquarters at Yeovilton in Somerset today in perfect flying weather for his first hour's instruction at the controls of a Wessex Mark V helicopter. It's the start of a three and a half month flying course, at the end of which he'll be qualified, like his father Prince Philip, to fly helicopters, including those belonging to the Queen's flight. I think that it was actually probably a character forming experience for him because it did give him a sense of working with the armed forces and that's something that he had a lifelong respect for. So while it's fair to say that Charles was not the most distinguished member of the RF has ever been, it was certainly an important time for him and something that I think affected and led to the man that he's become. 
if later on I'm to be associated with all three services, it'd be a very good idea to do an attachment with each one. I think it gives one a, a very useful um, experience, a very useful experience of responsibility and discipline. I think responsibility is the most important thing, is the actual trust that's put in you to deal with other people and the feeling that they can perhaps put their trust in you as well. Well, Charles's great uncle, Dickie Mountbatten, Lord Mountbatten, apparently once said to him that it was important for him to sow his wild oats before he got married. There was a real sense of Charles that he was expected to have a bachelor life because his father had not had much of a bachelor life. I mean, he'd had girlfriends, but he had no serious relationships before he married Princess Elizabeth. And I think we have a family generally fought with Charles that he shouldn't marry before he was 30, that he should date as many people as he could and see what came of that. And on the one hand, he wasn't necessarily the most outgoing of men. He wasn't necessarily somebody who was going to be a lady killer. But on the other hand, he was a Prince of Wales. There was no shortage of people who would have married him. Well, Charles is like um, a very old fashioned, a very respectful, charming man. He likes women. He is definitely not a woman hater, um, and he is also a people pleaser. Well, he met Lady Diana Spencer in 1977 because he'd actually been dating her elder sister Sarah for a while. And when he first met Diana, she was 16, and it was an unequal relationship because she was still a girl, but there was obviously a spark between them, a spark of interest. And of course, at this stage, Charles was still seeing Camilla Shand, who later became Camilla Parker Bowles. So I think it's fair to say that on the one hand, the relationship with Diana was not necessarily an obvious love match from the beginning, but on the other hand, there was very much an, in an interest on both sides. And she was somebody, perhaps because of her youth, who was not phased by responsibilities that she'd have to take on if she became Princess of Wales. Yesterday, you were a nanny looking after children. Um, now you're about to uh, marry the Prince of Wales, and, and one day you would well, I know likely he'll be queen. It's a tremendous change for someone, if I may say, of 19 to make all of a sudden the transition. It is, but I've had a small run out to it all in the last six months. <laughs> and next to Prince Charles and I can't go wrong. He's there with me. The months between the engagement and the wedding were hectic, often exhilarating, sometimes trying. She had to learn the restrictions of royal life. Never again would she be able to walk quietly down to the shops. Prince Charles had to keep the engagements he'd accepted before the announcement of the engagement, and this meant some separation. Diana had to accept this and do her best to hide her feelings. When Charles and Diana were asked in their engagement interview if they were in love, she replied, of course, and Charles more or less shrugged and said, whatever love means. Each of those answers is disingenuous. Diana is answering, of course, because she doesn't want to try and get into any kind of deeper question. She wants to brush away the answer. Charles's whatever love means is, I think, an attempt on his part to try and say, that's a ridiculous question, why are you asking me that? I'm not interested in responding to it. However, it was the worst possible thing he could have said because for decades afterwards, that has been taken to mean he doesn't love Diana, he's doing this because he feels he has to, he's been forced into it, he couldn't care less, she could be anyone. And I think that a lot of the public ill will towards Charles comes about because it was felt he wasn't in love with Diana. And that response, I think, has led to a lot of it. And I suppose in love. Of course. <laughs> Whatever in love means. <laughs> well, it's you obviously your own interpretation. Obviously, means two very happy people. Yes. Well, yes. Congratulations. Well, from us, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Of a royal wedding was by far the biggest event for the royal family that there'd been since the coronation nearly 30 years before. And it was something that people were queuing up on the streets to see it. There were millions and hundreds of millions of people watching it worldwide because it was bringing glamour to the royal family. It was the idea, I mean, the famous picture of the kissing of Buckingham Palace balcony, one of the most reproduced images of the royal family of the 20th century. 
And it was one of those days that was freighted with pageantry, freighted with pomp, and it was designed to show at the, at the beginning of the 1980s, at the start of Thatcherism, that Britain could still put on this kind of event that would still excite people, it would still show off what soft power could do. The best places are filling up and everyone's making sure it's going to be a great day. Buckingham Palace, which has seen so many royal brides since the young Queen Victoria was its first, marrying Prince Albert 141 years ago. The royal carriages, the Queen's procession and Prince Charles's little procession will drive down the leafy mall to Admiralty Arch in the distance. And five minutes after the Prince of Wales has passed, Lady Diana and her father will come out from Clarence House in the glass coach, just with police outriders, for she's not royal yet. I feel rather sorry for Diana, actually, because she was caught in the middle of it and she was still so young at this stage, I mean, she's only 20 years old. And the idea of being placed in front of the world's cameras and the world's media and essentially told to perform must have been absolutely terrifying. I mean, Charles had more experience of it, of course, he'd been doing it for longer, but it still must have been overwhelming for him as well. I think that their relationship was troubled after the birth of Prince Harry, and one of the reasons why it was troubled was simply because Diana was essentially running her own show. She was getting a lot of attention, but her husband wasn't. She was somebody who was being fated. She was being seen increasingly as a fashion icon. Things were starting to unravel a bit because I don't think it, it, it matched what Diana had expected. She had this vision of uh, being like a fairy princess and being carried away into the sunset. But the minute she was married, her husband was off working. I mean, it was, you know, he, he's always been a very hard worker and he was devoted to his duty. Camilla Parker Bowles was the great love of Charles's life and he met her in the 1970s and she was a debutante. She was not from the highest aristocratic background, but she was a sort of comfortable country gentry background. Well, Charles was in love with Camilla from a very early age, you know, when he was still in the Navy, he fell in love with Camilla. She was funny, she was a great rider, and she made him laugh. And I think that Camilla has this, she, she's very, very attractive to both men and women because of her personality. She's got a wonderful personality. She wasn't felt to be suitable as a wife for him precisely for this reason. I mean, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, felt that one of the Spencer daughters was far more suitable. And so you can see that if, he, if Charles had been allowed to marry Camilla when he wanted to marry Camilla, the whole trajectory of the royal family would have been entirely different because they got on very well, they shared a similar sense of humour, similar interests, they obviously found each other very attractive. And this was, I think, one of the tragedies of the, the last day royal family, that. Charles was simply not allowed to marry the woman he wanted to. Charles' reaction to Diana's death in August 1997 was absolute horror. I mean, there's no two ways of describing it. The mother of your children's been killed very suddenly. There's no possibility of preparing for it. He was in a state of shock, and I think all of his actions throughout that time have to be seen as his mother and Charles are his best, actually. He went to Paris straight away. He was a person who was responsible for bringing her back. He was very much somebody who was lobbying her to be given every single state funeral and all the rest of it, against, I think, his mother's and grandmother's wishes, because they saw her as somebody who'd left the royal family and wasn't entitled to this kind of treatment. Whereas he, with half an eye on his public reputation, took the argument, she is going to, she's the mother of the future King of England. She deserves this. And I think that you can see, I mean, we have no idea what their relationship was like after their divorce. We don't know for certain if they ever met or what the, what the correspondence was like, if they dealt with each other very much, if they were communicating through third parties. But certainly, I mean, it must have been the most awful shock for him, as it was for everybody else in the country. Well, Charles's marriage to Camilla in 2005 was it was a civil ceremony rather than a religious ceremony. And it was very much felt, I think, by everybody in the country that they'd finally managed to make each other happy. And I think that if they'd been allowed to marry 25 years before, the world would have been a much better place for it. 
that. But I think that what had been done so cleverly was that Camilla had been seen during Diana's lifetime as a rather villainous figure, which she really isn't. She's a very charming, very lovely woman. And what happened was this PR campaign you know, a year or so after Diana's death, but Camilla and Charles were seen together in public. She was very much acknowledged as his companion. And eventually after, I mean, it was quite a long time. I mean, it was eight years between Diana's death and their marriage. I mean, he could not be accused of rushing into it. The, the, the Queen saw the change in Camilla and she saw her dedication to duty. And she also saw her dedication to Charles because she, she so helps him and he wants her at his side and she will be at his side. So she's got, she's almost in a queen mother type of role. You know, queen mother was there for her husband in his weaker moments. And I think Camilla will be there for Charles. I'm delighted for the Prince of Wales and Camilla Parker Bowles. It's very happy news. And when the cabinet heard it this morning, they sent congratulations and good wishes on behalf of the whole government. They've waited long enough, but tonight they emerged as a couple soon to be wed. If you've been together this long, you've perhaps a right to demand a ring worth waiting for. And in this regard, the royal family doesn't disappoint. Camilla sported a whopping diamond upon her finger, and she was clearly on a high. Congratulations. 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 Thank you very much indeed. Congratulations. Well, you can have a dress. <laughs> How are you feeling, ma'am? Um, all right. Just all right. I'm just, about, I'm just coming down to work. Did he get down on one knee to propose? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Can I just do another picture of us? The king's relationship with his wife is is fantastic. They are the best of friends. There is no question on that. I've, I've witnessed that. They're the best of friends. They're a team. They work well together, they support each other, they laugh together. It's it's wonderful to, to see and, and to have been part of to be part of that, you know, to witness that. I remember when the engagement was announced, I was actually with the King in the in the morning, uh, when obviously it was Prince of Wales at that point, and I was with him. And he went off to I think to London. And I went into the staff room and it said that the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall were going to be getting married. And I was completely shocked because I had no idea, as did everyone else that was around that, that day. So it was a closely guarded secret. But I was equally happy because I, I, uh, I adored Mrs. Packer Bowles. So I got on really well with her. And I was excited about it. And then I got the, the phone call. I think it was about a few months later, all the invitations started arriving for the wedding. And I was, I didn't, I, I hadn't qualified, I hadn't been there long enough, you had to be there a year. And then I got a phone call from uh, from London, from one of the, the team, uh, senior members of the team, to say that the, the Prince and the Duchess were personally inviting me as their guest, because I hadn't been there long enough to go as a staff member, so they were inviting me as a, uh, as a guest. They wanted to personally invite me. And I was so, I couldn't believe it. I, I, remember, the, I remember that day so well. I was so excited and put the phone down and I think I was probably phoning my, fr my family and friends so you won't believe it, I'm invited to the wedding. Your Royal Highness, uh, eight days now to the wedding. Can I ask you how you are you, you feeling? Heard how in it, particular <laughs> Princess William and Harry are feeling at the prospect of the marriage? Very happy, very pleased. Be a good day. Prince Charles, how are you feeling? Well, it's a very nice thought, isn't it? I'm very glad you've heard of it anyway. Uh -huh. Prince William, can I just ask you, are you looking forward to being a witness? Yes, very much so, definitely. As long as I don't lose the rings, I'm all right. Yeah. With one responsibility, I'm bound to do something wrong. The wedding was amazing. We went to the wedding uh, 9th of April, uh, 2005. It was an amazing day. It was at Windsor Castle. Uh, we were at the castle for the, the, the reception. Queen, Queen did a speech. Um, you had all members of the family there. There was a real party atmosphere. It was fun. William and Harry were there. There was a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. Watch William and Harry chase after the, the car as the car drives off with the, 
the Prince of the Dutch Kong was so much fun, really funny. I think they decorated the back of the car and everything. It was a, it was absolutely wonderful, and, and she's always been a support to him. She's always been absolutely wonderful. So the, the king served the longest apprenticeship, I think, in history as Prince of Wales. And I suppose you might think that he was frustrated, maybe, or you get to a point where you want to do the job. And, and from my view, that was never the case. He he enjoyed being Prince of Wales. He did a, an amazing job. They'd never been the Prince of Wales. It had more or less created it into an actual job. And that's what he did. He made it an actual job. I'm delighted to say we've got a new member of our weather team tonight. Uh, let me hand over to him now. Your Highness. Well, it's an unsettled picture as we head towards the end of the week. Uh, this afternoon it'll be cold, wet and windy across most of Scotland. We're under the influence of uh, low pressure and this weather uh, front pushing northwards is bringing cloud and outbreaks of rain. The rain, of course, will be heaviest over the borders and uh, around Edinburgh where it could lead to difficult conditions on the roads. Uh, in the west, rain will be lighter and patchier. There will maybe a few drier interludes over Dumfries House in Ayrshire. Aha! There'll be snow for the higher ground of the Highlands and Aberdeenshire. The potential for a few flurries over Balmoral. Who the hell wrote this script? Uh, as the afternoon goes on. The best of the drier and brighter weather will, of course, be over the Northern Isles and the far north of the mainland. So. A little hazy sunshine to the Castle of May in Caithness, but a cold day everywhere with temperatures of just eight Celsius and a brisk northeasterly wind. Thank God it isn't a bank holiday. <laughs> well, what, what Charles has done throughout his life is in addition to his convention and royal responsibilities, he's had a real interest in making a difference in the lives of younger people. And so the major thing he's known for is Prince's Trust, which is this organisation which specialises in giving out funding to disadvantaged organisations and individuals and trying to make their lives better. And the thing about the Prince's Trust is that it's a brilliant idea. He's had the public persona and the ability to actually make it work. And so it's one of those things that even people who don't like the royal family and even people who have Republican sentiments would usually agree that Prince's Trust has been a force for good. And I think that what you can see in Charles is genuine desire to make things better for people. I mean, he genuinely is somebody who has said, I worry about the fate of my subjects. And I think that's true. I think he does. I mean, he doesn't always get it right, but none of us would. And I think that the Prince's Trust and Prince's Foundation are real concrete steps to actually helping people's lives. So when I, when I created the Prince's Trust in 1976 to help improve the lives of disadvantaged young people, it was because I was so acutely aware of the challenges that they faced. And over the years, some of the um, challenges have changed. But the overall mission uh, of giving people self-confidence, self-esteem, and better opportunities remains the same. And in that time, we have helped over one million young people. And I always get, used to get so annoyed that it hadn't got to one million long ago, because we had to keep counting people who were still going through the system, even though we were actually helping 50,000 people a year. I thought, I know my maths is bad, <laughs> but... So we've helped over one million young people transform their lives, and the Prince's Trust now works in 18 countries across the Commonwealth and, and beyond. I would like to take this opportunity to say to you, Charles, how proud I am of everything you have accomplished with the Trust and the way you personally have inspired this organization. It is a very great pleasure for me, therefore, to present a Royal Charter to the Prince's Trust in recognition of its outstanding achievements over nearly a quarter of a century. Led in the job, you know, he, he, he lent the job from his 
his, his mother and, and father. The, his education was always about preparing him for the day that he became king. I don't think anyone would ever imagined that he'd been Prince of Wales for as long as he, as he was, but it's put me in a really good place of understanding the country and the world we're in today. So I think if you would say to me, is, is he, is he the, the best man for the job? I think it's safe to say yes, he is, because he has done uh, an, an amazing uh, bit of training. And as the Queen once said, famously said that training is everything. At the end of the day, that's the answer to everything. And it's true, it is the answer to everything as that training that her son had has now put him into a job that he can that he can undertake. Buckingham Palace has announced the death of Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. The Queen died peacefully at Balmoral this afternoon. The King and the Queen Consort will remain at Balmoral this evening and will return to London tomorrow. The late Queen and the King were very, very close. Her, her son, she had a, 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 a wonderful relationship with him. Again, a fun relationship, which we all saw. We used to see different events in London when he would suddenly call her mummy and she'd pull a face at him and, you know, there was a a, a wonderful relationship. Mummy. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they respected each other. I mean, he really respected his mother. He respected the fact that she was queen and everything that stood for. I think that probably the shock of the mother's, his mother's very sudden death and him being becoming king. It, it, when, when these things happen, you go into slight shock, so you act quite mechanically. It sort of protects you in a way. So I think he, he wouldn't have been overwhelmed at that moment. He, he would have been very emotional, but he would have kept it all in check. So I think he dealt with it on a very professional level, which would be really the only way to deal with something of that enormity happening to you. It was very surreal the day after his mother's death to see the King and the Queen's concert return to London. It was very surreal, because um, he was returning as a king. It must be the most extraordinary experience to walk through the gates of Buckingham Palace as king, something you've done untold times before as Prince of Wales, and to feel this garment of, this invisible garment of monarchy settling over your shoulders, because you start to think to yourself, well, what am I taking on? What is this responsibility? I mean, what does the future hold for me? So Charles is somebody who knows very keenly that there are these incredibly high standards that he has to live up to. And I suppose when he walked back through Buckingham Palace, he thought, right, here we go. She made sacrifices for duty. Her dedication and devotion as sovereign never wavered through times of change and progress, through times of joy and celebration, and through times of sadness and loss. In her life of service, we saw that abiding love of tradition, together with that fearless embrace of progress, which makes us great as nations. The affection admiration and respect she inspired became the hallmark of her reign. Charles has great delivery. I mean, he's practically like a Shakespearean actor. Well, he was a Shakespearean actor at one time. So his delivery of all these speeches is completely brilliant. And I think he, he writes most of them himself. And he delivers it with, with superb timing and superb emotion. And so I think that a lot of people found that much more affecting than they were expecting to, because just as the Queen was a kind of grandmother to the nation, he was very explicitly offering himself as a substitute. And I think that many people who wouldn't expect that they were going to be moved by it were moved by it. Queen Elizabeth was a life well lived, a promise with destiny kept, and she is mourned most deeply in her passing. That promise of lifelong service, 
I renew to you all today. Outside the royal court, the state trumpets sound. Before rolling news, the role of this part of the ceremony was to spread the word to a waiting nation. The Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. Prince! George, save the king! So the proclamation was quite special because the proclamation's always been, well, part of it is always private. The actual part that you saw outside on the balcony of St. James's Palace has been televised or recorded before. But what goes on indoors, you never see. So the fact we actually got to see him um, actually doing the, the signing and everything was quite, was quite special. Even if there was one or two little funny moments, but it was quite an important, a historical uh, important moment uh, for him and for us to all be allowed to watch that, which was, I, could, I mean, I was amazed that we got to see it. And, and again, it's one of those um, memories, I think, that we'll always, we'll always have. You know, it was, it was quite special seeing that. My mother's reign was unequaled in its duration its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. The proclamation of King Charles was something that took place just after his announcement as king, and it's something that was announced in every major city and every major town in Britain. It's something that, because it hadn't happened in so long, it hadn't happened since the 1950s, there was a real interest in it because people hadn't seen a proclamation before, but of course now they are seeing this man being proclaimed king, which is, again, it's something that's been going on for centuries, but it's still got a hugely symbolic role that we are seeing before our very eyes. The, reassertion of, of monarchy, the reassertion of kingship, because not a lot of people alive today are going to remember King George VI, his grandfather. So having a king again is really quite a novelty. The role King Charles III played at his mother's funeral was very much head of the family and also king of the nation. And I'm sure it was quite a difficult time, mainly because you know the eyes of the world are watching you. It's not a private thing at all, and he's aware of that. Everything he does, every, every action, every tear, everything has been watched and listened to and, and discussed. Well, Charles was obviously responsible for making sure that the, fu that the funeral went as smoothly as it did, because he was obviously the focus of attention. He was the person that most people were looking at in terms of how it was going to be for him. And he's somebody who I think was on the day, he walked behind the coffin, he was very much, you know, the, the focus of public interest, the focus of public attention. And he did everything exceptionally well. I mean, the funeral was very well organised. It had been, of course, organised. It had been planned for years, but it went off without a hitch, and Charles's involvement in that has to be seen as testament to the fact that everything worked well. There was an extraordinary outpouring of grief amongst uh, the nation because, you know, the majority of, of, of the Queen's subjects had never known um, another monarch. And it was kind of the end of an era. It wasn't just her death, it was the end of an era. It was end of the Elizabethan age as we know it. And of course, it was all so dramatic and so beautifully staged that that made it even more poignant. The, the you know, the soldiers, the, the wonderful music, the people that used to work for the Queen, walking behind her coffin was very, very moving. And uh, the crowd, we know, was, was crying. Or, or, or they were crying, or they were cheering, um, or they were just silent, completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. I remember when 
Diana died and the day of her funeral, you, you, could, you could actually, you could just hear the birds. You couldn't hear anything else. No sound from the crowd. And that is a sort of real high emotion. The first rendition in St George's Chapel of God Save the King, I think he nearly lost it um, because it was so emotional and, and the, the strong voices and the choir and everybody really, really meant God Save the King. And I think that that was extraordinary for Charles. been a very strange experience because you hear this song which you've heard a million times before when it's about your mother and God save the Queen and it's about the King and it's about you and it must have been a very extraordinarily cathartic experience in a lot of regards but also an overwhelming one. I don't think, I know he'll be a good King, he'll be a caring King, a compassionate King, he'll be a King for the people. Well, I always thought that Charles would make a wonderful king because he cares so much. He cares about his country. He cares about its heritage. He cares about the planet. And he cares about the people. And I think that he, that's really the attributes you need for a king. He is perfect. I suspect that Charles will be a modernising monarch. I suspect that he'll be somebody who tries to fulfil his own interests. And so far he's been popular, so far you look at all the polls and there seems to be general approval for what he's doing. But he's still very much of a honeymoon period. I mean, we're not going to see yet, for quite a while, as to how he really is as king. I mean, he's only been king a matter of a few months. So his king's speech at Christmas was very well received. It was short. It was very well delivered. It dealt with social issues again. I mean, it was something that was cl quite close to the first term of New Labour in terms of its emphasis. So we'll see. I mean, we'll see what he's like. I mean, he's got everyone's given him the benefit of the doubt. He has his flaws, but everybody knows him. His flaws are, don't come as a surprise. But with Camilla at his side, I think he is going to be uh, wonderful and compassionate and understanding and all the things that he needs to be.